Hi, hi, family. Welcome to your work auntie podcast. My name is Claudia Marie Holmes, and I'm your host and your work auntie. Um, and thank you all again for listening and joining us to talk about things that will help you create and enhance your abundant life. I'm so excited to introduce my guest today, Kara Harden, who is with the Practice Lab. I am so excited that she can join us. And I will say before I let Kara introduce herself, I listened to her speak about a month or two ago and I was just so moved and I was like determined to get her on this podcast because I think you all can benefit so much from what she has to offer. So Kara, with that, can you introduce yourself to the family? Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, first, uh, the name of this podcast just makes my heart uh, uh, feel alive. Um, I, I am humbled and so happy to be here. Thank you to everyone for having me. Uh, my name is Kara Hardin. I'm Chief Executive Officer of the Practice Lab. A registered psychotherapist, former practicing corporate and securities attorney. Far more interesting, I think, are my intersections and identities. Like when we talk about introducing ourselves, we often start with what we do. And that's like the strangest thing to me ever. But it's norm. So I did it. And now I'd like to tell you about the parts of me that really matter. Um, I am a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm a daughter-in-law, an excellent daughter-in-law. I'm an acquaintance. I'm a cousin. I'm a friend. I'm also white, I'm cisgender, I'm heterosexual, I'm neurotypical, I'm a settler on the land where I live and work. I am 39, she is looking at 40 with the yes. one, two punch. Welcome and I'm Jewish. Soon. <laughs> yes, I like can't wait, I can't wait to be 40. Yes, it's awesome. I feel like I'm actually like a booby in a 39 year old body. And when my outside is finally congruent with my inside, I'll make sense in the world. Like I just seem to be you. And then people will be like, oh, I get Kara. Um, and so these are all the parts of me that I'm bringing to our conversation today. And I'm so humbled that the talk you saw was resonant and so excited to be on your work, Auntie, and to glean from your wisdom. Yes, I'm excited to have you. And actually, uh, that day when I listened to you speak, I was invited to speak at another conference. I was on a panel later myself. And one of the questions they had pre, you know, prescripted was what did you learn as your career you know in your in your career and the thing that resonated with me was the difference between being resilient persistent but understanding that you should not be enduring <laughs> it's like and I was like enduring means a level of suffering and there were so many things that you said and shared that I was like oh I gotta share this and people have to hear because resilience is so important like yes there'll be things that don't go well and you need to you know get bounce back but then if things are never going well, there, there's some evaluation that needs to be done, but understanding the difference. And so I was actually in an episode and you're actually referencing that episode um, before the holidays, because that was my gift to everyone was the gift of resilience. Um, so you inspired that episode and also influenced my talk that day. So wanted to share that with That's you as well. Thank you for that. And I just am pausing to unpack the real, like, golden nugget there that I just heard because I want to make sure because you said like so there's resilience which is this ability to face adversity mm -hmm. and to gather your resources in positive psychology it's like to bounce back mm -hmm. right to like gather your resources and persistence to mm -hmm. keep going yep. and that enduring is about it, right like a situation that was permanent or pervasive mm -hmm. or somehow personal and knowing the different how and what are really yeah. interesting because i often find in the space of mental health people are looking for bright line tests like how do i know this job is toxic how do i know kara that i should stick with this my kiddos learning how to play the drums like why is that important? And then now I'm thinking to myself, well, is he enduring? Is he enduring this experience? Or does he just need to learn persistence? And I'm thinking of, you know, a ton of my clients and your listeners that are like, oh, should I stay at this job? Well, are you enduring? Is this feeling permanent? Is it feeling pervasive? Is it starting to corrode your sense of self? Or is it resilient? 
Clara, thank you so much for that framework. And I'm humbled that I was inspiring to any part related. <laughs> well, thank you. That's really, well, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. No, thank you so much for that. Yeah, I just really, because there were jobs where I felt like I was in, like, I didn't really know the difference yet, but I was like, I just can't get past this and it's not something I could fix. But what I also shared with people is there's a level of evaluation you need to do to determine if it's enduring versus something you can, you know, be resilient about. Like, is it fixable? Like, can you have a conversation? Uh -huh. Have you spoken uh -huh. up? Is it you? <laughs> like, are you, are you not picking it up? Are you not learning? Are you not communicating? And so <laughs> it's like, you have to figure those things out. And once you do that analysis and it comes that oh it's not me I've had the conversations I've spoken up I you know I and then you're like oh I'm enduring there's nothing I can do about the situation it will continue to feel the same and be horrible and that's when you move on and I and that's when someone asked me they're like well when should I move and I was like do you feel like this can't change then you should it's move on. interesting because I think so often um when we're making it so so we're using this job example so i've switched careers a number of times to become closer and closer to this entrepreneur and mental health educator but i started my career as a lawyer and um i was always taught that like when you find success you will feel happy and i wasn't taught it explicitly mm. like my parents were never like be successful like that's how you're going to be happy but they would right. be like, getting grades will help you get into university and university will help you get a job. And if you have stability, then like, why wouldn't you be happy? And so like in more and less direct and indirect ways, I was kind of taught achieve status, achieve wealth, achieve mm -hmm. influence and you will be fulfilled. And so there I was a corporate and securities lawyer at a fancy schmancy firm and I could do the job. And I was mm -hmm. finding that there were parts of myself that would come alive, like the amount of intellectual problem solving and the people I got to work okay. with. Like, I really liked that. But what I didn't like was doing legal work. Like at the end of the day, right. I didn't like the work. And so we often talk about like toxic work situations as if someone's quote unquote doing something bad or can't hack it, or not right. good enough. And if I had stayed a lawyer, I absolutely would have been enduring. But it would have not been mm -hmm. anyone's fault. No one would have been doing anything right. wrong. I would have been picking the parts of me that sort of believed the programming around success, or loved the intellectual problems, or really adored the people, more than the parts of me that one day wanted to be on a podcast with you and didn't even know it. <laughs> right? Right. And so that yeah. idea is really like to pick apart the complexity of like, how does someone make mm -hmm. sense? As in the, you're not doing anything wrong. The system is flawed, but it's not necessarily perhaps in this way, in this moment, evil. And still you might want something different. And yes. that's okay. Yeah. And it's okay. And being brave enough to just do it. I didn't necessarily, I'm still in the same general career area, but I was a federal employee for a long time. And then when I hit my 10 and a half years, I was like, yeah, I'm done. And the number of people who went, what, why would you, why would you leave your good government job? <laughs> and I said, because I want to do something different. I, I don't know if this is it for me. And so I've stayed around the same kind of HR functions. That's the area I focus in. But I was able to do so many cool things with during my time away. Now that I'm back with the government, eventually I plan to leave again. But it's again, it's the same thing. There's nothing wrong. But in order for me to be happy, I want to do things that inspire me, allow me to be creative. And one of the things is you move up. And you know this because you're an executive and, and you've been a leader. The politics and uh, I wanted to be removed from the politics and just be free to produce. And when you're high up in HR, 90% of your job is politics and managing people's expectations and having that. And I was like, I just want to do cool stuff. I want to, you know, empower people's lives without the drama. But I got a lot of pushback. But, you know, you have to just 
or know that it's okay. So that's the part that you said, it's like, it's okay. And you don't have to justify to anyone because when they don't pay your bills, even if they do pay your bills, like let's, <laughs> they gotta pay it forever. They don't go to work right. for you. They don't have to put on their, their clothes every day and go deal with the people and the situation you deal with. But again, there be nothing, might be nothing wrong with the people or the situation. It might just be time for you to try something new and and take that leap. There's so. two there's two thoughts I'm having that are related. One is the research is actually really clear that success does not lead to fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Fulfillment leads to success. It is the opposite. When you are happy, you are more likely to be successful. This is Sean Aker. He used to work at Harvard, just like a little place that nobody's really heard of. Um, I don't even know if that was a good joke. <laughs> I don't think it was. <laughs> that was a good that was a good joke. <laughs> I don't think that was. I was like, oh man, I'm dissing Harvard. I didn't mean to. Um Sean Aker, I was trying to say he's super reputable, but like that came out. Yeah, he is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> no. And best. so Sean Aker out of Harvard has this book called The Happiness Advantage. Um, and also um I think it's like five, it's like he has a TED talk on the five steps of happiness, but there's also another book, which is phenomenal called Dark Horse or Dark Horse Project. No, I haven't heard of it. Unbelievable. Okay. And they break down how, when you do things like understand the, your motivators, understand your choices, understand the best strategies for you to reach for the choices that motivate you you will be more likely to be mm -hmm. successful. And they, I, I don't want to ruin the book for people, so I'm not going to explain the stories, but they chart really specific, unique journeys. Like, you have a mm -hmm. podcast. Like, at one point, you decided, this would be fulfilling to me. And then you stepped into it. There's no blueprint for that. <laughs> and what I see time and time again... I haven't been able to articulate it quite yet, but there is a profound uh, despair maybe in this world of work mm -hmm. where there are folks who are like, yeah. I don't, I don't like this and I don't want this, but I don't have choices and I'm trapped. Yes. Like, I have to I work have here. To I have to pay the bills. And because I have to, they've removed the choice in the matter. Mm -hmm. They're like, I have to do this. I have to pay my bills. I have to pay my student loans. And part of that is, okay, I have to do all these things as well. well. And part of it is, like, this is the systemic part. Like, it is, like, capitalism is both true and absolutely punishing. I mean, it's, it's an ideal and it's a theory, but, like, the systems in which we are rewarded and, like, survival is real. And at the same time, mm -hmm. we're all, it's like we, we believe that if we just endure, that we will like endure mm -hmm. enough in the right way, be good, be right, get it mm -hmm. accurate, don't rock the boat, that somehow on high, we will feel fulfilled. And everything will work out. Somehow, if we're just, it's like this, this, the despair for me comes from a place where I see all of these grown adults feeling like if I could just play this system, which is so profoundly broken, well enough, if I could just mm -hmm. be perfect enough, Kara, then I will be safe in this system and then I will be happy. And what I see in my work, in my private practice and in my life is life is just unfair. Life is profound and unfair. It is not to excuse it, but this system is is painfully inequitable. And trying to play by the system's rules is is it it I don't know. It's it's despairing because they're they're made up. Mm -hmm. And it's exhausting. It's, ex it's exhausting as well. Cause I, you know. <laughs> I was in a role once where I actually loved the work, mm -hmm. but it was all the play around the work that really just tired me out. And so I started pulling back from my friends. I hardly ever talked to my family because I was, and I would keep saying, I'm just tired, guys. Yet. I spent all day 
talking to these people and yes. doing these things. But I always would tell people, and I even still say that if they ask me about the job, I was like, I actually loved the work. And if I could just go do that work and not have to do all the other things around yeah. it, you know, waking up at seven in the morning to have calls and, and getting an Uber zone calls and apologizing to the driver and literally taking naps and not eating or cooking for myself anymore. I was like, I, I would then be happy, but if the work has to come with all of that, I don't it's want it. Right? And so when I left, it was like the pleasant, most pleasant job I've ever left. Like we had parties. I had like five or six happy hours. Lots of, it was no hard feelings, but I just knew what I had to say. I was like, this is just not for me. While I love this job, it's literally killing yeah. me. <laughs> because yeah. I feel like I've lost my choice and control. That, and and the, the idea that there was like, a, if only you could have meditated more. If only you could have made yeah. smoothies and namaste and made better connections and different mentors. And if only you could have just been good enough, that job actually would have been perfect for mm -hmm. you. That's the despair I see. Right. It's people who genuinely believe mm -hmm. that. So can I ask you a question? I yes, guess, so can. how did you recognize that it wasn't about being good enough or being perfect enough. How did you switch that inside of you to know that the job just like could never be a fit for you? I think it was, for me, it was honestly some health issues too, where I was just like, I was like, this isn't working. Like my body is rejecting what I'm doing to it in order to be successful. So I have to change something and I can't immediately magically fix my health problems that have happened. So the thing I have to do is move myself from the situation. So I just sort of chose me. So it wasn't even really a conscious like, oh, I can make the job. I was just like, nope, I have to choose me. And choosing me means leaving. And an opportunity presented itself and I just got on it. I ended up not even staying in that next role longer because I didn't actually love it. Um, but I knew it was a good way to at least break free of that situation. But it's funny, I still talk to my former supervisor there. I talked to all my colleagues because I really did love the work and I love the people. It's just that was not for me. I was, you know, I stopped cooking I ate out almost like one time I did the math, I was eating out to the equivalent of probably five or six thousand dollars a month. Just stopped cooking, was ordering out all the time. And then, you know, when you order, you have to order large quantities to get it delivered. And, and so I'm wasting food. I'm going to happy hours and things that I don't even love drinking. So it's just like, I'm like, this is just not the life I want. So I just have to go. And I think now I'm more aware of like how to tell people like to say, choose if choosing you means doing something different, then choose you every time. So, and for me, that was choosing me. Choose you every time. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a really three profound words. Like choose you every time is something that folks are not taught to do. Like we're, we're yes. taught like, just be good and do what's right. Mm -hmm. And it comes with follow the follow rules. The rules. Like, and, and it's like, here's yeah. the path. And if you do that, you'll like the, the implicit promise was supposed to be like, you'll be safe. But that's just like, that's not life. That's not the world. And you've done this amazing thing where you've been like, oh, I see that and I will choose me. And this is why you're the work. And, and like I said, if someone presented that job to me today in a way that would work for me, where I still felt like I was being chosen, sure, I would do it. But how it was then, I could not sustain it. And like I said, one of my most favorite jobs. I am so proud of the stuff I did there. Love the people I worked with, but I'm just like, yeah, no. And everyone was surprised. <laughs> there, but like, what a beautiful description. Like, see how granular that was. That's another thing where I, uh, that I talk to folks about who are thinking about, do I like this? Do I not like this? Like, it's granular. You're like, I liked the work. I liked the people. I liked this part of the project. I liked engaging in this way. I liked perhaps where it was located. You didn't say that, but I made it up. I made mm -hmm. it up. You liked the location, right? <laughs> right? You liked yes. like. Somewhat. <laughs> yeah. Right? 
did a lot of Ubering lot of around Uber. DC. I was Uber Platinum for a while, so it was yeah, nice. Yeah. Was <laughs> um, but I didn't like the hours. I didn't like the overwork. I didn't mm -hmm. like the pressure. I didn't like the demand. I didn't like the assumption that we would all work all the time. I didn't. That was the mm -hmm. part. And the proportion of dislike and the intrusion it made on cooking, on walks, on seeing friends and on my life. I didn't like the other stuff enough. Like that's a profoundly personal, it goes back to what you said before about assessment. It's a profoundly personal evaluation that no one else can do for mm -hmm. you because right. your mama's going to be like, you take the stable job and your friends are going to be like, right, exactly. but you pay for all the Ubers. If you leave this job, right? <laughs> who's going to pay for all the Ubers or your friends are going to be like, no, we miss you. You definitely <laughs> should quit the job. Like, oh, Exactly. They're like, we don't see you anymore. So how did you get so clear about what you know inside uh, to be true about you? Like, how did you get so clear about your preferences? I don't know. I think sometimes I still struggle with them. I think I've been in enough situations where I want other people wanted me to stay and endure because like you said there's this idea that you should just stick with it or it'll get better or you're being too critical and then also especially as a black woman oh you you guys are always complaining and you're so angry no I am accurately assessing a situation that is making me unhappy and so I just started saying like look I just have to do what works for me and what I also tell people is I also did the work where I felt confident that whatever I chose I'd be okay and I could still find another way if that was the right choice so I think it was a combination of building up the self-esteem and I always say this to people I was like I'll be fine I could find another job <laughs> and it sounds very cocky but I was like I made sure that I felt safe enough and even if that's not true I still believe it <laughs> that I will be fine I will always be able to find another job so I'm willing to take the risk in a way as well that's just like well this isn't working and even that job I loved they actually I can go back anytime like that's how much like the experience was so great they're like oh if you want to come back just let us know but I knew that I, so I also had a safety net in a way, but I just knew that it wasn't working for me at the time. And I was honest with them. I was like, I like the work. I just can't do yeah. this. It's all the stuff around like, it. I can't do the hours. It's all the I, stuff around it. Yeah. I was like, Rewind I can't do that. Rewind to the part. They offered you. No, no, no. I told you, you said that. Well, they actually offered me, they were like, oh, we'll let you move. Like when no one was remote, because this was pre-COVID. And I was like, well, I'll just move home. Because I was like making up reasons <laughs> to get removed off this project. And they were like, oh, we'll let you. They kept offering me like a green. They're like, oh, we'll let you work remotely. Oh, we'll let you do this. And that's how much they were like, oh, we also want you to stay. And I was like, oh, my God, none of the things I'm trying to do is working. So I'm just really going to yeah. have to quit. <laughs> yeah. Like, is that your suit oh yeah I so eventually I did <laughs> yeah I was like because uh, I was like I really don't want to work remotely from South Carolina but I was like saying things at the time that I thought would be acceptable to be like okay you could leave you could do something I different. feel like you tried to do like the slow breakup like you tried to get them to break yes. up with you but inevitably like you yes, just had to break up with them <laughs> like you just have to be like you know what it's not you really it actually is me and there is uh, you're changing in a way that is unhealthy for you you need to just accept who you are here. And I don't want to keep damaging you anymore. <laughs> exactly. And they were like, no, girl, stay here. I got a ring yeah, for you. Like, and no, no, no. Well, so... I lock this down. And you're like, oh, you're right. <laughs> you're looking out. we yes. have to rewind. Have to we have to here. rewind if it's okay with you mm -hmm. to the part where you said, is it okay with you if we rewind? Yeah, sure. Yeah, To absolutely. the part where you I love how you're like kind of interviewing me like, too. It's kind of like one. I this is this is the danger of having a therapist on your podcast. Is it's really hard to get them to talk about that? Um, you said you did the work on your self esteem so that you knew you could get any job. Specifically and prolifically, what was the work you did? So 
I'm a planner to the point where it's probably not actually good as much as I plan. And I remember when I started my career thinking, what do I want to be? And I would sit down with other people's job descriptions at higher levels. I would read job announcements and I would start making checklists of like, what are the things I know? What are the things I don't know? And then I'd start asking for those experiences. And I sort of created this thing where I was like, anything in HR I can do. And I literally went around the life cycle and made, and then there were some things I didn't want to do. And I was very clear about that. I was like, oh, I don't want to do employee relations. I don't, I don't want to do, I don't want to process. But the things I really knew I wanted to do, I like checked it off. And then once I got there, and then that's also one of the reasons I chose to leave when I left the government, I was like, yeah, this is also stifling my idea of me wanting to be very marketable. So I want to leave to make sure I'm fulfilling to all my promise to myself, which is that I will be able to do anything and always be able to get a job. And so once I felt like I checked that box for me, I'm just like, well, I'll just go leave. I can always find another job. And, and I truly, I still believe that to this wow. day. And in this moment, if someone calls me, I'm like, yeah, sure, I could yeah. do that. So yeah, I just really planned. And so I think a lot of people don't want to do that, but it's not hard, especially in the digital age, everything's online. If you have the desire to mm -hmm. be the next, the next person with a, 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 for a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist, look it up. The job descriptions are posted. They tell you exactly what they're looking for. They tell you exactly what they need and then get into action just go do it and that's what I did I was like I want to work on this I want to work on that I want to do this and then I started checking it off oh I can do this I can do that and so I'm at that level where I am no longer a prisoner to a situation that don't work for me it I mean it's a recipe for an abundant life one yeah. one and two it really um it's like evidence so when I engage with people and even in my own life, there are times when um, the success hierarchy matrix framework will be like, ooh, I don't know if you're qualified. I don't know if you should ask for that much money. I don't know if you can. Like, you know, it's imposter phenomenon or, or imposter syndrome, like whatever we want to call it, the like feeling underneath is I don't know if I'm yes. good enough um I don't know if I'm enough I don't know if I'm smart like fill in the blank enough and when you have a eight point plan that has shown you all of the experiences that you have curated for yourself it's a way to go huh well is that accurate or is that historic like is it true mm -hmm. that I'm not really enough or at some point in my life, did I learn that I was only enough when, when someone told me I was enough, when I got the results, when I stuck with it, when I endured, like, where have I learned mm -hmm. about enoughness in my life? And is that what I'm replicating right now? Or genuinely, am I not qualified? It's a right. really, the data, I'm mean, having and data I like that's super helpful. Yes, it is. I'm having that. And I always say a lot of my episodes start out with preparation because a lot of what I talk about is preparing yourself so you feel confident. Like if you go into an interview and you didn't practice, you didn't think about the questions, you didn't look at the job script, you're not going to feel confident unless you're just a naturally just confident person who believes you can't do any wrong but most of us will go into that situation and you're nervous your ears you don't know how to respond um and like i said i probably overplanned but literally when i start interviewing i'm not right now but if i get into like oh i'm interviewing it's my season i'm trying to find jobs i will make whole scripts of here's the potential questions here's my answers and i will answer everything to make sure i'm there one of the things though that I try to balance is not applying for things just because I can't do something. I will tell you my current role, there were several things in that announcement where I was like, I don't actually know how to do that. Like I have no clue, like, and no part of my eight point plan, as you said, did I identify that as something I needed to know. And so I almost didn't apply. But and I remember sitting there like, I was like, well, I could do like most of it and it's I should be able to figure it out so I'll apply anyway and we'll just see what happens and I got the job and I'm in the job but it was definitely a moment where I was like oh I don't know how to do these three things should I not apply 
And often, especially with black women, we do that a lot. We're like, well, I can't do everything, but do you need to do everything? No, no. That's why you have staff. <laughs> and, and I feel like it's interesting. So there's definitely research about this and I'm trying to remember who, who did it and what it was for. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they divided demographics just by gender or by race, but it's, and so I don't want to talk about, but there's research around interviewing and the disproportionate amount of women potentially even subgrouped to BIPOC women and how they will disqualify themselves if they don't see everything mm-hmm. that they meet on the criteria versus like yep. a mediocre white man that's like, oh, like I definitely could try this and right. put their name in. Yeah, I'll right. figure it out. And it's like part <laughs> of how we're socialized. Like the confidence is a privilege that comes from like life mm-hmm. always working out around you. And so what made you feel like it didn't matter this time that you didn't need to have all the criteria. I think part of me was knowing that that was a statistic that we did often did to ourselves. And I was like, I'm not going to be a statistic, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just going to apply. And then also realizing that I had nothing to lose if they didn't apply. I've also gotten to a place in my life where I've accepted, like if they don't hire me, then it wasn't meant for me. If they think I'm not qualified, it wasn't meant for me. If they're racist and don't want to hire black women, thank God. Because <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be your token. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so I'm so part of me. It's like, it's is what it is. And then like, I, like, I believe I'll find something else. It'll be okay. I've leaned into a lot recently, something very similar. So like I'll, I'll apply for speaking engagements or for consulting projects or like whatever it is. And the part of me that feels like I have to have it all figured out, like I've been telling her, you know, it's their responsibility to vet me. It's their responsibility to be clear about their objectives. It's my responsibility to be honest Like, I'm not going to lie and say I've done something I haven't, but I can't say I haven't done that. Here's what I've done is similar, or here's how I think about that. That's interesting. What are you trying to get out of that? Here's how I'd approach it. Like, rather than it being an evaluation of my goodness or my rightness, it's a conversation. It is a conversation between adults about interests and motivations and capacities and experience. I have started to try and look at it less episodic. Like here's one thing I have to perform at and more part of like a running mini series. Like, oh, here's like this and how could it contribute to that? And this like changing a mind to process orient versus outcome orient to be a lot more willing to put myself out there and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think remembering that one, we won't die with rejection. Cause I think rejection and, and the interesting thing about me is the things I apply to work. I don't always apply like in real, like, and that's part of, you know, rowing is knowing that, oh, when it comes to relationships or dating, it's like, oh, you don't want to be rejected, but at work, I'm like, it'll be okay. And I think also being a manager and having mentored so many others is I often have to explain to people who are high performers hey, we don't actually pay you for perfection. We just want something <laughs> that, that will move us from point A to B that at least is compliant with law. And I was like, even lean and lean six sigma or any quality control practices, they're not looking for perfection. They're looking for a good number, some consistency in products. But I was like, Apple upgrades my device every day because there's something wrong with, with the software. And we and we buy expensive Apple phones every year, you know? So I have to remind people and I think put myself in the world of reality of like, no one is paying you to be perfect. No one's looking for it. It's a really, it's like something I know up here and sometimes I know in <laughs> here. In this world where folks get canceled, where everything is on, everything is recorded, everything is big. It feels, uh, and everything is performative. Like everything has an angle of like, um, are you watching? Are you not watching? Like we are showing ourselves, like we are literally 
taping our work in progress as if we are complete. I think that the, the fear, like when you say we are not paying for you to be perfect, I have seen and in myself experience such fear around what it means to be wrong as if there is yes. a singular like as if I am a monolith um and the thing is like I am yeah. wrong many about many things at the same time that I'm also right about them like when we flatten ourselves in that way we really do ourselves and each other a disservice and yet that is what we see happening around us all the time again and again all oh, that's good so it takes courage it takes bravery to kind of go like yeah i'm complex and i can hold it's almost like what you said that work knowledge of i'm not going to be perfect at work and also i'm just not a perfect human being so there are going to be times right. i'm going to let people down i'm going to hurt people i love I'm going to disappoint myself. I'm going to come up short. I'm going to do something that I'm embarrassed and ashamed of. And I can be accountable right. for that and still make sense at the exact same time. And still know that I'm valued and still awesome and and still can't do a red. Like there's always that person in your life too that also never thinks you do anything wrong. So also, also knowing to someone, you're still an idol and you can't do anything wrong. Sometimes that's my mom. Sometimes she changes her mind. But, you know, for the most part, it's like, that's what you have to remember. So, it, and it's only a moment. It's a snapshot. Um, I just finished appraisal season in my role. And one of the things I told my employees, I was like, I really try hard, even if there's something for you to work on or something that did go wrong, to never formally write that in your appraisal. Because I don't want one snapshot in your career to ruin the rest of your opportunities or chances. And so I always frame things as opportunities and challenges and you should. And so I think lately I've been really focusing on how I relate to others and then try to apply that same thing to me. So if I'm not going to use a snapshot in someone's performance for an entire year to bring them down, then why am I going to take a snapshot in my life and bring my own self down or make myself less of a person? So I think it's also like a lot of people don't do that too. Like they want the best for others and they're like really good mentors and, and even like good therapists, good coaches. And then when it comes to themselves, they're just so critical and hard. So I've been trying to be very intentional about, you know, if you're being, be as good to that person, be as good to yourself as you are to others. Hopefully if you're a good person, if you're not a good person, you're listening, <laughs> you know, maybe start small <laughs> with at least being good to people around you before you start being good to yourself. Practice kindness a little. <laughs> Just, yeah, I love how Just I love the little. image of someone listening to me like, oh, I guess this episode didn't apply to me. And just like taking out their earbuds and I'm be like, oh, I didn't know. I thought it was for everyone, but just only good people. Okay, I guess I'm out. <laughs> I guess I'm out. Um, you know, it's like you're here. You know, you can start today. Start today with kindness. Call your mom. But call call your friend you haven't called in months, call your grandma, call your mom, call your dad. Like just start today with kindness, you know, if you're working through that. But yeah, I feel like so many people I talk to, like we go out of our way for others and then for ourselves, the first thing we do wrong, we're like, oh my God, I'm the worst person on earth or I am so ashamed. Okay, but you just gave that person the best pep talk on the, on the earth. Where's your pep talk? for yourself the way that i understand it this is something i i i'm so glad that you mentioned this i think that so people make sense and so how does it make sense that we can be so kind to the people in our lives logically know we deserve that kindness and then be just monsters to ourselves um and i think from a very young age it feels for some folks that the best way for them to establish safety security and connection in their life like i'm talking childhood is mm -hmm. to get results or to have people like them or to be accurate or to make sure everyone around them is stable and it becomes really important 
that they play that role in their minds, Mm -hmm. but they're just children, right? Like if you've ever seen a child trying to solve an adult problem, it's very ineffective. (laughs) But a child doesn't (laughs) know that. A child doesn't know that the way that they're going about solving this complicated thing um, isn't working. What they do know, though, is that if the problem is them, then they're safe Mm -hmm. because they can fix it. If the problem is that people around them or the circumstances around them, they're up the creek without a paddle. And so from a young age, we learn, oh, like it actually helps to be vigilant inside, to criticize, to play small, like that like good, bad binary is very young thinking. And we think, oh, I'm bad. And then we're like, okay, good. That was bad. I just will be safe because I won't ever do that again. And then we become these adults. Yeah, the absolutes. Right? We start thinking in absolutes. Yeah. And then we become these adults that are walking around the world being like, oh, God, I just ghosted that person. And that's awful. And I'm an awful human being. And I'm so embarrassed by it. Or I, I said this to this person. And I am that's a part of my identity that I don't want. And I don't want to be a part of that. Or I love this person. And I've been told my whole life that that's not someone I should love. Or, or, or like it cuts across not only behavior, but sometimes our intersections and how society has reflected back to us what matters. And so as adults, we're taught to pump one another up. We are not taught to regulate, soothe, and love ourselves. Yeah. And so. Which is unfortunate. It's unf- and yet work auntie shows up. She's here for it. She's filling yeah. the cup. Right. Because the the work is, oh, I don't actually have to fix myself. I don't have to solve myself. It goes back to what we were talking about before. It's not about meditating. It's not about the juice. Though those are great things. If those in your inner world are like what you need. It's about when I feel unsafe inside like obviously if the world around you is unsafe you get yourself to safety when this is coming from inside you it's about pausing and going huh where did i learn that and how do i show that part compassion because that young inside never deserved that yeah Never deserved that. One thing you made me think of, too, when you were saying this is also things you learn as a child, is I've noticed lately a lot of people lean into the the labels of, I'm an introvert, so then I only can do this. I'm an extrovert, so I'm going to be good at that. And I feel like also leaning so hard into these labels, and I don't think the labels are necessarily childish. I think it definitely probably didn't meet the intent of the people who originally created these concepts, right? <laughs> when, you, when you think about psychology, but I also feel like those labels are so limiting in terms of people saying, well, I'm a, I'm an introvert. Because I, I will talk to sometimes with younger people about the importance of networking. And that's what they, their response is, well, I'm an introvert. Okay, probably so is Jesus, Jeez. but... So- <laughs> I, I'm like I'm like I, I don't but he so like I, I'm like there's a lot of people out here who are introverts but it does not mean that you cannot make a difference and that you can't introduce yourself like yeah, right? I don't know he's like going to marry all these people there's just so many people That's around right. me all the time I just like need to charge right, my battery like- Right. He's like, that's why I hung around a while and rolled. We waited a couple of days before we came out. You know, he's like, it was just too much. Like, come on. I I think what the thing you're pointing to is is that monolith problem again, because you might be introverted, but what other parts of you exist? Like, it's a really funny example. So I'm squarely introverted and my job is incredibly social and I am social, but I get my best energy. Like someone, someone said to me, you're turning 40. What do you want? And literally the first word that came to my head, first word was solitude. Solitude is the first thing that came to my head. And I I was like, "Mm." okay. So that's a whole thing to unpack. And I sit with like, it has been a very social couple of days for me and we're doing this podcast and I have dinner with my friend tonight and I have 
a whole day tomorrow that's very social and then it's the weekend full of the kids and it turns out that even if you're introverted like your kids still want to spend time with you it's beautiful right and i remember saying to i said to my husband right before the pod i was like so what do i do about my friend tonight and he's like i don't know what do you do and i thought okay so the introvert part of me my battery is low but the friend part Mm -hmm. of me misses her like as a person and if i want to have her connection in my life i cannot always let the introvert win and the business person she's brilliant needs her advice and Mm -hmm. she might need something from me and so Yeah. yeah i'm an introvert i don't like the networking dinners i would prefer to stay home and watch the rollout of the vanderpump season tonight mm-hmm. i don't right. <laughs> want to go part of me but the rest of me she's going and so the introverts just gonna deal with it and i'll i i made plans on the weekend i'm gonna have a couple hours to myself this weekend so i love that you thought about that like thing that people bring up and i hope that yeah. like thinking of ourselves we are complex beings there are many different aspects of us that exist at the same time and when we shrink ourselves to only one thing we miss our joy we miss our beauty we miss our sophistication yes. and we can't be abundant yeah exactly and it's like creating itself and stepping outside of yourself one of my favorite because there's so many assessment tools but one of the favorite ones for me is the strength deployment inventory (laughs) um because the i forgot his name right now but the psychologist who developed it his idea was like it all lives in you he was like yes you may be motivated by certain Uh things you may have certain behaviors that you regularly go to but you have the capacity to borrow from or exhibit any of those behaviors depending on the circumstance. And so it always is so limiting when someone's like, oh, I'm an introvert, I hate networking, or I'm an introvert, I can't speak at this conference, and a, or I'm an extrovert and these people are too quiet, I need to be in the office. Okay, yeah. what else what about I- you? Like, and like you gave your example of, what other things are, what are you trying to accomplish? Like you want to be there for your friend, right? And you know, you want to also like think about like getting that connection with her that you need, but people often, they just focus on the label, the model if, as you said, of like, I'm just this thing mm-hmm. and that thing is why I can only do. And not to even get into this bubble, we'll have to talk about it on another time. But it's like, even people labeling themselves society, I'm an alpha male. So I oh, can only oh, you be this that way. Can of you open that <laughs> I'm like clutching my pearls. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that's where she went there. It's because it's like, it's just a label you gave yourself. It means nothing well, in the grand scheme of reality. We're not werewolves. Exactly. Or We're what actually is true is actually about chickens. It's chickens about chickens. chickens. <laughs> I was like, so and you're not even a rooster or a hen, and you're claiming this pecking order alpha thing, and, you know, to label why you have to move the way you do in society and groups. Like, it doesn't make sense. What are you trying to accomplish? Yeah. What behaviors will get you there? And is it something that you're comfortable with? Like, does it make you feel good inside? And I feel like so many people just, they they get on the label. Because I'm big into astrology and I will tell people all day, I'm an Aquarius back in what it's in the forest. <laughs> it's like, and I am not apologetic about it. But I also know I am, like you said earlier, I'm a middle child. I am from a small town in the South. I am a black woman with locks. I've I've lived in like eight different states. Like there's so much more to me than just being an Aquarius. And so, you know, that's always, I think so many people limit themselves by these labels. And that's also why sometimes I think they're enduring because they've given themselves some label or some circumstance that they're like, this is real. Mm -hmm. I, I live there. And so you built this city that you can't get out of. I'm just thinking about that. One, I know nothing about Aquariuses, yeah. but I'm about to do it. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Any, I'm, I'm Pisces. I don't know what it means. I don't know what my moon rising is. I don't know any of it. You sent me the info, though, because I... So, because I think what happens is all of these... We're taught to look outside of ourselves. 
to constantly look mm-hmm. outside of ourselves and be like, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And in some ways, as kids, we have to. We don't have language. We don't have, all we have is like, we're crying. And so the looks people give us, the words that they give us, they help us interpret the world. Um, but that's reinforced all the more by this performative social media society and all of these things. Mm-hmm. And so developmentally and as we are um, growing societally, we are consistently being like, tell me who I am. Tell me how to be happy. Tell me what I need. When when everything is like, well, actually, you are unique and there is no one like you. We are all the same and we are all different. And your difference is need to be explored so you might be aquarius with all of these other intersections and in any given moment being an adult is looking at all of the intersections all of the resources all of the options and making choices it doesn't mean the context is fair it doesn't mean there's a right or wrong it means you have a hand in your life it may be a small hand it may be a bigger hand. Do you see it? Do you recognize it? And what are the steps you need to take to get closer to it? And of course, very importantly, how is the society, do we give more people chances to meaningfully move closer to themselves? Yes. That is amazing. I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking, we can just uh on. Uh-oh. I know, but... I, I'm like, you're going to have to come oh, back. No. That's what this means, Kara. We're going to have to find another time so we can talk more and share. I mean, I really feel like I won. Thank you for asking me great questions, but also answering so openly. And I think so many people can benefit from this to really think about, you know, what context from a child are they bringing into it from their childhood that they're bringing into adulthood and not really evaluating, but also just looking at their circumstances to see like what evaluating how can you create that power for yourself and choice? And that's what I'm, you know, if, if anyone's done the landmark forum, you're like, this is what I'm standing for, but that's what I'm standing for for you all. In order to create that abundance, you really have to really look and be introspective, but not live in that introspection. Okay, now that you know what it was, how can we move forward? Well, with all of that, I want you to share where people can find you and reach you. And then we'll just, we'll let them know where you're coming back. <laughs> we just have to have another episode. I'm coming back. It's Kara Hardin, K-A-R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N. And you can find me on LinkedIn. That's where I am most active. You can find me at thepracticelab.org. It was a pleasure working with you on how we can be both accountable and make sense at the same time. Thank you for letting me ask you questions and for your insight. You have an energy that is... Um, so humble and um, competent at the same time. It's just it, it, you. you're it, it a real, I learned a lot talking to you. So I appreciate you having me on. No, thank you. I learned so much from you as well. And I'm so excited um, for you to be in my friend network. Pisces and Aquariuses are like, that's. <laughs> <laughs> we want yeah. to confer. Yeah, yes, no, I'm yes, in. yes, we're in. Yes. And so, but this has been amazing. I think there's so much good content. I can't wait to see the comments. And I have a couple of people who literally personally text me. They're like, I listened to this episode and they're my thoughts. I cannot wait to hear them. Um, but no, I'm so thankful that you were on this episode. And I'm looking forward to bringing you back to talk more. Because we didn't even get, for the listeners, we didn't even get to any questions. It was just a natural, fun conversation that I hope you all can learn from. Um, and Carrie, you're so amazing. And I'm so, so thankful I got up in the cold and came out to that event that day <laughs> um, because truly our intersection ha- will be life is life changing and will continue to influence mm. my life and others. So thank you. Thank you. And we will hit. <laughs>